This is Startup a Storefront. Business is like basketball. It's all about the pivot. And Allison Kane, the founder of Haven's Kitchen, is no stranger to the game. Haven's Kitchen was founded on the mission of empowering home cooks. The first iteration began with cooking courses. Then it grew into a cafe and events held in their New York City kitchen. But over and over, she kept getting the same feedback. Everyone loved the sauces, but no one had the time to make them. And from there, the ready-made sauces were born. In this episode, we spoke with Allison Kane, the founder of Haven's Kitchen, about her experience going through the Chobani Incubator Program, the problems with how I built this podcast, and why she wants to be the fairy godmother of CBG. We hope you're ready. This podcast episode is filled with some crazy flavor and spice. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Allison from Haven's Kitchen. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much for having me. For people who don't know, what is Haven's Kitchen? Haven's Kitchen is what we call a creative cooking company, helping home cooks feel like champions in their I kitchens. I love that. And we use creative cooking company because we do have a line of sauces, like fresh mm-hmm. sauces and pouches, but Which we're not delicious. a condiments company. Okay. We feel like, you know, our roots are in a cooking school and we've been teaching people to cook, not just follow recipes for, you know, over a decade. So all of the content that we're making to support home cooks and future product lines are part of what Haven's Kitchen is. So we, we used sort of a vague yeah. kind of word. To, what made uh, you want to start the company? What was the thing that gave you the idea of like maybe making this, you know, real CPG, getting it everywhere? Yeah, I mean, the company basically started as a cooking school in New York. I had five kids before I was 33. And you know, my youngest was in nursery school. I decided to go back to get a master's degree, what I thought was going to be public policy. It was in food systems and food studies, which is, you know, very much about personal habits, you know, politics, religion, ethnicity, gender through the eyes of cooking, but also very much about farm labor practices and the environment. And Cooking is this one sort of act that people don't think of as a political act, but at the end of the day, the more you cook from home, the better your, you know, meals are, the more you're doing for the environment. There's a lot of connectivity to the larger food system. So I opened a cooking school in 2012 because there just weren't that many people that knew how to roast a chicken or how to pick a sweet potato at the farmer's market and what to do with it. After several years of running the school and teaching cooking, our students started saying, I totally love that you've taught me how to make chimichurri, and I'm probably not going to make it on the regular. (laughs) Like, I don't mince oregano that well, and I don't really want to do, like, the shopping and the chopping and the cleaning. The sauces are the thing that makes the meal. How come these sauces that we're learning in class don't exist in the grocery store? All of those things started happening. So I tried to figure out a way to make a better sauce for home cooks to feel really good about what they're making at home. They don't need a meal kit. So we launched the sauces in 2018 in 14 New York City Whole Foods, closed the school in 2020, and that's obviously the year that the sauces kind of exploded sure. in the yeah. CPG world. Did you go for funding right away? Or how did you, what was the initial concept? The initial concept was, you know, A, I don't know if you notice this, but I am on the older side <laughs> for the founder world. Um, and I have a very sort of brick and mortar mentality. And what I mean by that is like, we didn't buy a hand dryer until we had the month closed you know, prior until we knew we had the cash. So there was no like scale and growth and exit. Like those words didn't mean anything to us. Mm -hmm. We were all about margin and all about profitability, which turned out to serve me absolutely relatively well, I think, but it was a little bit of a salmon upstream swimming. I don't know what the expression is, but you know what I mean? So to answer your question, I used profits from the cooking school to fund the initial 18 months or so. And how many how many flavors did you first come out with? That's always like the hard part of startup. It's yeah. always like you have to have, especially in your world, or like beer or something like that, where you have to have like six. We started amazing. with four. Okay. We promptly got rid of one. What were the four? Um, there was a peanut lemongrass, which has reincarnated herself as the coconut cashew. Oh, nice. Delicious. We'll okay. Talk about that yeah. journey. <laughs> uh, chimichurri was at the beginning. Yep. The romesco was at the beginning. And then we had a kale walnut pesto that we couldn't figure out how to get the the basil from not graying. 
like at the top and it drove me crazy. So I basically discontinued it like just out of ego. How long of a time period are we talking about for the graying to occur? So at that time we were making them in an incubator kitchen and then we moved to a small co-packer. We still hadn't really sort of professionalized the process or industrialized the process. By the time it got on the grocery store shelf, there was like that little tip, you know, tip in the sure. spout. Just enough to right turn thing. off the consumer. Just enough to make me terrified that the <laughs> yeah. consumer would be turned off. And I was just like, the world, does the world need another pesto, especially one where like we're asking them to like just squeeze the little top right. out, you know, yeah. so that so it went away pretty quickly. And then back to the funding, once I realized that there was a there there. Mm-hmm. Our velocities were like immediately, immediately wow. kind of amazing. Wow. And that was good and also terrifying. Why do you think that was? You know, I think it's because we had such a beautiful community already established from what, six years so it's of like a pent cooking up, school. People understood it. There yeah. were people who just, okay. they recognized our name and our logo and they were just picking up whatever we were putting down. So I think we underestimated that. I don't, I don't think I even knew what I had when I look back. And that's why it was so scary when we went national in 2020, the first week of COVID, because I was like, people in you know Sacramento don't know what Haven's Kitchen is or who we are. Or mm-hmm. They're not invested in us. But in New York, they were. And so, you know, we would go, we would, you know, go on Fresh Direct and we would do a swipe up to buy and they would sell out. And they had never seen a condiment do that kind of velocity. So once I knew there was a there there, that's when I made a deal with the co-packer who invested in the company. Oh, nice. We needed to have a valuation because they that's wanted you a percentage do. of yeah, the company. Of and I'm like, ah, well, let's figure it out. You know, right. <laughs> Whatever you're putting in, let's multiply that by whatever. And that's when I did my first sort of, you know, Funding. baby round. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You went to the Chibani Accelerator Program. Yeah. What was that like? It was amazing. Yeah. I think the, I was Were the a little... Chibani founders involved in that or who's Hamdi, Hamdi, he's involved? this was his personal sort of mission. Okay. Um, okay. He's just a magnanimous man yeah. at the end of the day. And he... He doesn't get enough credit in today's society, in I today's world. I don't think like he, he does. I don't think people know that. That's an employee-owned company and he's made everyone at that company a millionaire. And it, it's a story that gets law. I don't know. It's it's kind of a bummer when I think about the press where I think like he he's really figured out a people centric way of uh, approaching capitalism. Yeah. Which I think is difficult. Yeah. Because of ego mostly and also greed. Yeah. But um, he, he was he's done, he, he does did really have well. institutional investors that he yeah. ended up buying out. Yeah. I think at some point along the journey too. Yeah. yeah. I mean that that program. I was probably a bit too early to really juice the lemon as much as I could have. They were talking about price sloping and I was like, well, we, we have one. What does that mean? What does that mean? I I think (laughs) it means, um, having a very clear, you know, price pack architecture. So, you know, knowing ahead of time what your Costco pricing is going to be, what your Walmart pricing might eventually be knowing sort of like which retailers, are going to need which margins and right, right, right. planning your, you know, that, you know, five ounce pouch, for example, in fresh should probably not be a product in certain retailers because of the margin. Because of the margin. Yeah. This is the one thing that I think entrepreneurs miss at the beginning. It's always like they, they always p- price themselves too low and they don't factor in that they should be making money. Right. And then the problem is if they have a good product, they have to now raise their price yeah. and, most entrepreneurs deal with this like imposter syndrome moment where they don't think people will pay the price mm-hmm. that they need in order for them to stay in business. And yeah. the advice I always give them is like, unfortunately, if people want your product, they're going to have to pay the price they want. That's the only way you're going to be sustainable. But a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with kind of knowing their worth, I think. I think that. And then when you take sort of the zeitgeist of forget about profitability, just grow. Because if you build it, we'll figure it out. Or, you know, hey, we'll keep supporting you through, you know, a 10% gross margin and, and, and we'll, we'll get you there. And somehow volume will solve that. That's a misconception. Or your first product might be a 10% gross margin, but we'll build the brand so beautifully that you'll be able to then swing it up to, you know, 50. And yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we internally have this discussion a lot. I've always, you know, it's not 
rocket science, but again, coming from a brick and mortar cooking school, you know, I know you got to figure out margin yeah. on any product, whether it's a service or a packaged good before you can offer it widely. And then the next piece I think is that, you know, you don't see LinkedIn posts like we have an eight units per skew per store per week velocity. Woo. You see, we have 10,000 doors. Woo. Right. Right. Exactly. But when the velocity, velocity is really the thing that matters. A hundred percent. That's the only thing. And it takes a minute to figure out where your fish are yeah. and how to get that velocity to where you want it. So for me, it's like figure out margins, figure out velocity, and then put the fuel on the fire and figure out distribution. Right. Because that's, I mean, not the easy part, but it's very hard to undo yeah. if you don't figure out the first two. That's what Paul's doing. That's, that's what I love when he came on the podcast. He was sharing how his first few deals were like basically no money that they were making as a company. And uh, as he grew, he, he had to unwind some of those deals and make them a little more profitable. And uh, luckily, because of the velocities, yeah. the retailers were happy to comply. But it took, it, you know, we're talking probably three, four years later. Yeah, 100%. The, and that's, that's, that's Velocity the Velocity is the, you know, I mean, I'm not a mathematician, but, you know, it costs a lot of money to open a door. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. It yeah. costs less money to kick the door a little wider open. Mm -hmm. right. It's just less effort sure. energetically. Yeah. Sure. Already got the relationships. That's well put. Yeah. Not to go completely left here, but w you have a podcast also. I do. And so why, what made you want to start your podcast? There's a story that I read about a guy in like northern England who fancied himself like a DJ. And he was like for his 80th birthday, basically, his wife built him a studio in like their barn and told him that it was he had an hour long show on the local radio station every Saturday night, which was not true. It was a lie. But he went into that studio and he was like just living What's his up? best life for one Performing hour as if, every as if he Saturday. Was, yeah. Just and then the radio station of course found out and then gave him a show, whatever. <sighs> I'm a little similar in the sense that I just needed help. Okay. I, I just needed to have conversations with people. Therapy. Therapy and also like what is a margin and sure. what are mm, operations. Sure. Free advice. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. I needed free advice. I'm not comfortable asking for free advice. Yeah. So I figured I could do two things. I could <laughs> offer them a, a, a spotlight. Yeah. Whether or not anyone yeah. was listening on the other side. Didn't matter. Didn't really matter. Right. Yeah. People respond really well to being asked to be on a podcast, if you haven't noticed. Uh, they do. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Even when they're out. a half an hour late. Uh, you're totally fine. Um, and the other thing is, I also know that I'm really privileged to have access to a lot of people that other founders don't. And so I was having these conversations with, you know, these people from Chobani or people who had their launch events at Haven's Kitchen and I got to talk to them. I knew the, you know, head of operations at Bonza at the time, all of those things. And I, every time I was having one of those free advice conversations, I felt kind of guilty that I wasn't sharing, like people need to know this stuff. Where, where do people go? And this was again in 2018, there just weren't all of these startup podcasts. There just there was how I built this, which basically makes you feel like garbage, right? And then <laughs> why, why do you say that? That's an interesting it, take on it. I mean, f maybe speak it, freely. Just me, no, yeah, no, 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 no. I have our He take. has strong opinions too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. In agreement with you. Okay. So you can well, speak freely. To me, again, the analogy is: Are you teaching? Like, for my cookbook, it was like brass tacks. Right. Don't worry here's how you actually like preheat an oven mm -hmm. as opposed to one of those beautiful coffee table cookbooks where there's this amazing, elaborate, gorgeous dish that no home cook is ever right. going right. to be able to make without wanting to shoot themselves. So <laughs> to me, how I built this is like, oh yeah, I remember in the past distant, like when I was on the couch and I used every credit card I had and, but now I'm a gazillionaire right. and yeah. trust yourself. Like, thank you. That's not that I need to know, like, no, when you say make a sales deck, that's 10 pages. Like, what, is what does every single mean? page yeah. need to say? Yeah. Just tell me. That's yeah. literally why we started this. So how yeah. I built this, if you unpack it, is also like there's an orchestra behind it. And so it's like watching a movie. 
There's, yeah. It's actually never just two people listening and talking. Interesting. Not like Joe Rogan, which is literally just people talking. There's no music. There's no, here's the drama scene. Yeah. yeah. Right? yeah. And, and also, I don't know, but he's a reporter. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, he doesn't understand the realities of starting a company. Right. And when you don't understand that, you can't go deep. You can't tell people what's in the sales deck, right? right? You it's can't, all platitudes. You, it's all just, and, oh, yeah, yeah, and then it was great again, and mm -hmm. then it was hard, right. and then it was great again. <laughs> yeah. And it's yeah. like, let's go on this beautiful song and dance. And that was it. I was like, I hate this. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. know how I built this. I call I mine, like, this. how the bleep am I going to build this? Yeah. Like, that's oh, I like my, that. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. What we Thanks. found from our podcast is it also presents opportunities to collaborate in interesting ways. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that yours is, has provided the same resources for you, but I'm curious, like what specific examples that you've found of, of those collaborations have you been able to uh, arrange? I mean, that's a really good question. I, I mean, for sure there have been brand partnerships that have come out of it, 100%. You know, I mean, at this point, I started in... May of 2018. I'm on like my 180 something episode. Yeah. So us too. I think you might yeah. be 180 actually. You right oh, yeah? now in this seat. 180. 180. Yeah. I'm pretty great. Right? Winner. Yeah. Winner number. Yeah. Uh -huh. nice. <laughs> yep. That's awesome. There should be some music or orchestra <laughs> yeah. we'll behind add that you, in. right? Yeah. 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 It got hard, <laughs> and then it got easy, <laughs> and then it got hard. Um, <laughs> you know, I um, so brand partnerships for sure, investors for sure, um, and even just. It's a lonely job and, and having connectivity to other founders. Although I will say I, I, I get a lot of incoming from founders. I really like to interview service providers and, you know, agencies and people who aren't telling their own story, but helping, really sure. helping. Yeah, actually helping. Um, yeah. So I hope I can be actually helpful, yeah. not just talk about myself. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, those connections, relationships, introductions, and that community building, I think, is is really important. And I think also it's helped me help other people a lot, which is, again, I'm, I'm someone was like, you're like the fairy godmother of CPG. And I was like, that's a, I love that. I would love to be a fairy godmother if I can. Put be, that on yeah. your business card. I know, exactly. You know, because I do. I really... I really like connecting people and I really like saving people time and money and energy. Yeah. You know, what are the, are there like three or four things that you can point to on your podcast that you've like that you remember daily or things that you have taken into your business that you almost see repeated with all the other CPG companies that you can just spew? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, let's start with ops, right? So I think that margin question is is really fundamental and i think there is a misunderstanding that volume will solve it and it doesn't and i don't know where that came from so this economies of scale idea like that happens when you're yeah, like yeah Amazon, way, way way beyond later. where we're gonna be yeah. in, as founders right ideally we're out long before totally. we start seeing that type of maybe a little in packaging but like my oregano isn't gonna <laughs> go down tremendously right. when I start doing Costco, right? right? So I think that's a misconception. I think there's questions around, you know, everyone uses sort of the platitude of like, build a relationship with your co-packer. Like, what exactly does that mean? How are you supposed to build a relationship with a co-packer? Invite and, them to your kids' birthday parties. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, and what, where, like, where does that start to be really inauthentic, right. you know? And what does it mean to manage a co-packer? What does it mean to manage a team? What is it... You know, those are things that are fundamental, I think, learnings that you really need to have. And now there's this sort of swing back to self-production. That has its own list of challenges, especially in today's labor market, right? Like, there's a lot of stuff, I think, on the op side that isn't necessarily fun and sexy to talk about, but is really critical for emerging brands. And then obviously there's the sales piece, which is don't go wide, you know, core than more, everyone says the same thing. And yet you still see people like posting their door counts and as if it's a good thing to be in 15,000 stores after three years, it's very likely not. Yeah. And then there's marketing, of course, and there's a lot of tools. You know, people think brand building is marketing. That is part of it. But there's also very, there's like a real in-store point of sale 
grabbing that shopper who's walking by thing that I think people have missed in the last couple of years because we've been so dominated by digitally native companies that, you know, we've forgotten wholesale. Now it's back in spades, but it's almost like everyone's kind of caught like, wait, what? You know, when you got shelf ready packaging, what, like, what does that mean? Like what needs to go on the front of pack, yeah. right? Well, speaking of that, I know that I know that you have leaned heavily into QR codes on yes. the front of your packaging, yeah. and I read that you know you've seen a lot of interesting developments in terms of when people scan them, mm-hmm. like how people are scanning them, and you know, can you talk us through the decision behind that mm-hmm. and how your company has changed since the implementation of those QR codes? Yeah. I mean, going back to the Chobani incubator, one of the things that you do at the Chobani incubator is you have like a one-on-one with their head of this, their head of that, their head, you know, they, and the head of innovation sits down with me and he's like, so you need to stop innovating. And I was like, what? And he's like, you have flavors that nobody knows what they are. Like, <laughs> my, like what percentage of Americans know what chimichurri is? And I'm like, I'm 80 and he's like 40. And I was like, okay. And he's like, yeah. and, and Romesco sauce, like 10. So <laughs> that's actually really good advice. It was yeah. great advice. That's really good. So advice. yeah. So I was like, okay, thank you. And then he was like, on top of that, I mean, he said it in the nicest possible way. And I am getting to the QR code. No, I, on top of that, <laughs> you are putting sauce in a pouch. Have you ever seen that in the United States? And I was like, well, there's this one Canadian company. He's like, yeah, no, that's exactly. not a thing. And he was like, and then the third thing is that you're in the refrigerator. Do consumers go to the refrigerator to look for sauce? Do they even know what fresh sauce means or what cold pressed or HPP or any of that stuff is? I'm like, no. So he said, so basically you have like a lot of consumer education to do and you need to just stop on the like exciting stuff just get down to brass tacks so that was at the beginning of 20 in in september of 2018 at that point i was like we just need to show people how to use these things and the way to show people how to use these things is like showing them recipes and how how do we make it easy like maybe we put a qr code on it and then very promptly, everyone's like, no one uses QR codes. They're not a thing. They take up a lot of room. You have like two square inches on your pouch to actually say anything. So don't do that. So we didn't do that. COVID happens. I'm like, people use QR codes now. Like, can we, can we do the QR code thing? Which meant that obviously we needed to make the content. But to answer the question, like we have a lot of educating to do we need to show people how this is going to make their lives better and how to use it on a daily, weekly, right, basis. And the best way to do that is to show them, not tell them. So the QR code is there to just be a very easy, I can make this. The sort of secondary benefit is from a sales perspective, we are not only showing recipes, but we have textable shopping lists. I think we're the only people that are doing that. So you click into a recipe like a gingery miso roasted salmon. You're like, hmm, that looks good. You can click text me the shopping list. And while you're oh, in wow. store, wow. you get the shopping list, which if you are the buyer in right at the store, you're like, ooh, basket building. Very convenient. Incrementality keeps them in the store. You know, those scallions are a little bit of a whoom, ring, right? So again, like I said at the very beginning, we don't use content to sell our product. The content is part of the product because by necessity, we need to be educating consumers and we need to be a resource for them, right? Shopping lists, prep lists, cleanup tips, how to store my herbs so they don't you know, dry out and wither the day I get them home. All of that is part of what we see ourselves as and the QR codes help a lot. They also, I think, you know, we now know people scan them in store and people scan them at six o'clock on Sunday night. So now we know, okay, six o'clock on Sunday night, there's like a disproportionate number of people that are scanning. That means that they're thinking about what they're going to make for the week. That means maybe they're putting their Instacart order in. Like, what does that mean? 
Exactly. And how do we now make the content that serves them yeah. at six o'clock on Sunday night? What, what do we need to dig into here? You know, which sauces get the most scans? Has like the yeah. social media platforms moving to video made it easier to some way for you? Because now it's like, oh, who doesn't like food? We know food statistically does really well. Yeah. On 100%. TikTok and Instagram, actually. It's and it's endless content. Yeah. Endless. Right. And it's really fun to offer content that you don't have to pay for. Right. So in what you know, capacity does that mean people are are making it and sending it in or no, in the in the sense that, you know, there's a paywall for New York Times recipes. There's a, you know, a spawn con for, you know, Bon App. Right. All of the traditional like places where you would go for food content have been a little sullied from my perspective. And so they have to figure out a way to monetize that. That's true. Ours is just. You're giving it free. We're to giving consumer. it free. We're yeah. also like, by the way, you Put know, if you look at our at our Pinterest, there we're never like buy sauce. You know, right. even our right. TikTok, like we have fifty thousand TikTok followers. I don't think we've had one product forward. Now, the product's got to be in there, yeah, to yeah. some extent, right? But like, I guess what I'm saying is that it's not that hard to make content when you are, you're just trying to show people how to make dinner, yeah. right? And then you can kind of slice it a certain way for the Pinterest audience. You can slice it a different way for the seven second TikTok. Yeah. And then, you know, there's YouTube long form, there's YouTube shorts. Right. We have 12 minute videos. We have, you know, 30, th whatever, second shorts yeah. or whatever it is. And, and it's all sort of the same pie we're just slicing it up differently and totally. some people like the we, crust and some we know on like tiktok i think like 50 percent of the users will eventually make a purchase which is actually way higher than instagram yeah have you seen that like have you seen a translation of literal customers engagement all of a sudden and they, and they purchase can you so track that or is it is it we really don't send people to buy from us directly okay. so that trackability is as you know yeah. a little bit yeah, convoluted yeah, yeah. right if we're we have seen our velocities increase like 30 percent year over year at a time where people are cooking a little less than they were a year ago and through a price raise so our hunch is that there is some awareness connectivity to purchasing but we can't say for sure yeah so also tiktok is very gen z yeah and so is that is that your customer also also. Wow. Okay. It's interesting because, you know, I remember very early on in some marketing class, like you can't say everyone, you know, sure. <laughs> yeah. Who's your target? Yeah, who's your everyone. Demo? Everyone yeah. will love this. But I don't think that ours is as like demographics based as it is psychographics based, right? I think you can be 19 and living in a, in a, a, an apartment with three friends and Love want sauce. to make something good <laughs> yeah. and just like sauce and it's worth it to you. Or you can be, you know, in your 50s and you're feeding a big group of people and you want to put chimichurri on your steak. Yeah. They have a lot more in common. Like the Venn diagram is not generational yeah i think it's you know? who's hungry essentially or who <laughs> who cares about you know flavor who cares about ingredient panel and who doesn't have time to cook which is a lot of people yeah as you think about like expansion is it is it sticking to the sauces or is it what else what else so that's the fun thing right yeah. about being a cooking company we have sort of permission to go into any category that makes the home cook feel like a rock star. How well, do you do it? I'll come on <laughs> next do? year and talk about our 2024 launch. But okay. we do have a new product line in the works coming out like Q1 of 24. Well, you've already had so many iterations from from your foundation as a you know a cooking class and mm -hmm. then you launch into this event space and cafes mm -hmm. and then you do the sauces. And it's like when I look back at, at how far you've come in, in Haven's Kitchen, it's it seems like pivots that were just following tr signals that you were getting from the market exactly. and just constantly being aware of them and and reacting to them yeah. i mean is this is this new product launch a, a continuation of that 100%. Then? Yeah. yeah so first of all i really appreciate that you noticed that because yeah. it's something that i take pride in mm -hmm. um in the sense that i think a lot of founders are like 
now I want to make a candle. You know, and it, it's just <laughs> yeah. like, I, you know, I, right. what, why? And like, no one's going to be like, hey, that's probably not a good idea because, you know, you're the founder. <laughs> right. So, you know, that's I feel hilarious. like all along the way. So you're making candles. I <laughs> so, <laughs> surprise, you know, chimichurri flavored candle. Um, no, we were, like, UNFI classified our, like, edamame green goddess as hair care, which we thought was really funny for a while until we realized it actually wasn't funny. But, like, we right. were like, should we make a shampoo? Yeah. So, obviously, that's we're not so doing funny. that. But, I mean, yeah, I think when people talk about how humble they are it's usually mm -hmm. a red flag but i don't mean like oh i'm so <laughs> humble i mean like there's a humility to this business that was forced into me being a brick and mortar cooking school in new york city for all those years and you know you learn to when people are like you should really make blah blah right you learn to be like that sounds like a good idea let's just see how if that's a real thing you know we didn't have lunch at the cooking school for the first three years we had enough people coming in for coffee in the morning saying if you just make lunch we'll eat lunch so we made lunch there's this i always talk about like a sailboat right like you want to hold on to that sail or jib or whatever it is pretty tight so that you, you don't luffed around but you also need to know when to let it out when the wind's blowing so that you can like move forward and you're constantly listening having conviction listening is this a real thing are there enough people sometimes people are really upset like we discontinued our harissa we got a lot of upset people right but the reality was is that it wasn't just didn't get the distribution that it needed and it was, you know, a time where we really needed to sort of... That's a great analogy. Yeah. The really, boat. really good, the boat. Yeah. I wish boat. I was... I should probably actually look up what those <laughs> things are. You had it right. So luffing is when you let it out. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to luff. Yeah. Luffed? Luff. Luffing. 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 Yeah. You can call it luff. Wait, does luffing. it have a T at the end or is it just... No, no, no. Right. Just, That's even just, better. Just it's, just it's just Fs. Well, what's the name, Haven? What is that? It comes from, again, like, I want people to feel really good. You know, whether it's a physical space, a video that they're watching, or they're in their own kitchen alone with our sauce. I want them to feel, you know, my ultimate mission is more home cooks means better for the environment, better farm labor practices, right? There's this whole discussion, like, there's a lot of vegans that don't seem to care about, like, labor practices in the food system that can't be everything has to be like the whole system has to be addressed and personal health right family community you're not going to cook if you don't feel good about it you're not going to enjoy it you're going to do it as a chore that's not going to be motivating my entire like life's mission and the company's mission is like this is fun like they're like finger paints. Like, look at this beautiful yellow thing that I just get to like squiggle on top of my fish. Like, that should be a great empowering feeling. And so should the content, right? That goes back to how I built this. It shouldn't make <laughs> you feel like I'm not going to achieve that thing. Right. Because that is not motivating. Right. What is motivating is like, oh, okay, I see how I can apply this right now to my life and how this is going to like make things a little smoother for me. I'm going to do that. Well, if you do do stay-at-home meal prep, I would love to be part of your test audience okay. here in Los Angeles. I mean, Because I think what's happening in that space is interesting. Like, all these companies, are it's a race to the bottom. And so they're they're doing really dumb things. Like, um, they're assuming the customer won't pay X. And that's probably because they have feedback and mm -hmm. maybe some data to suggest that. But the problem is, and you'll notice a company starts a chicken's a certain quality, then it just starts going down. Mm -hmm. Now it's like mic now it's like microwave foods. Mm -hmm. And then it's just bad. And then yep. they go out of business. And yeah. it happens... There's so many examples of this. I wrote a opinion piece for the New York Post on the trouble with meal kits, I think in 2018. I didn't expect to get like calls. I mean, I really didn't know who was going to even read it and why and anyone cared. But, you know, I think the fundamental problem is, again, if you're positioning yourself as like, I'm going to help you feel confident in the kitchen, you have to scratch that itch. Meal kits never did that. They never gave people that sense of like joy and satisfaction and agency because, again, going back to the other podcasts that shall remain nameless, 
they they have this picture on the box of what you can make, but your thing <laughs> yeah. doesn't look anything like that, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's actually demotivating right. and stressful. And then you have all this packaging <laughs> and you're yeah. like, you feel bad. It's like so much packaging. Yeah. People <laughs> yeah. feel bad, right? You, you know, yeah. I have five kids. Like I said, the, the way to get them to do something more is not to make them feel bad. The way to get them to do something more is literally the way to get any human being to do something more is like, this gives me flow. This makes me feel good. I feel really competent. Mm-hmm. I'm not dreading the cleanup, you know, all sure. of that stuff. Yeah. It's all part of it. Sure. And it should be a haven. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks really for having it. me. Yeah. yeah super thanks for fun. making such an amazing product. Aw, thanks. If you made it this far, I bet you loved the episode. So you should join our YouTube channel membership for only $2.99 a month. This gets you access to one, the whole unabridged conversation. Two, you get the episodes on Monday, one day earlier. Three, you get two additional entries to our giveaways. Check out our Instagram to see what we've given away. And four, you get access to seasons one through three. That's over a hundred episodes of wisdom and life-changing advice. What are you waiting for? Join.